Thanks. Well, it's an, an, an honor and a pleasure to come to um, Bard. I, I don't get to um, New York very often, which seems um, crazy, especially because um, I think the anthropologist of art I most admire works just down the road, and so I'm grateful to have the chance to catch up with Fred Myers, but also to um, meet people whose work I've been aware of and who indeed I hope um, we can um, think about connecting um, with um, projects in Cambridge. Um, this, um, this talk is, is, um, um, draws, draws on um, um, the book um, you mentioned, um, Islanders. Um, if you've read it, bits will be familiar, but um, um, I hope have a different spin here so you um, won't feel the evenings um, redundant. On um, Wednesday, January the 26th, 1791, snow and sludge along the banks of the River Thames melted into the brown tide that surged up past Deptford, Southwark and the city. Among the many vessels on the river, a rowboat plied back and forth, two towers pulling the oars, two other men at times conversing, at times simply taking in the spectacle and the squalor. The younger of the two gestured towards St. Paul's Cathedral and observed, Hare Nui Etua. Kualelo was a young Hawaiian aged around 15. On this occasion, he was said to be not himself. He'd wanted to return home and was about to embark on a ship headed for the Pacific Ocean to that end. But he'd been in England for the better part of two years and the prospect of departure made him melancholy, his companion thought. Archibald Menzies, botanist and surgeon, had encountered Kualelo in China. The Hawaiian had arrived there on an English trading sloop, the Princess Royal, which he joined in January 1788 when it stopped for food and water at Molokai in the Hawaiian archipelago en route to the northwest coast of America. Having obtained a cargo of fur, the Princess Royal called at the island again but Kualelo, out of what Menzies took to be instinctive curiosity, begged the captain, Charles Duncan, to be taken to Britain rather than deposited at home. In China, he was transferred to another trader, the Prince of Wales, in which one James Johnston was commander and Menzies both surgeon and naturalist. Menzies had been collecting privately for Sir Joseph Banks, the greatest scientific entrepreneur of the epoch, and he shared Banks' curiosity about exotic peoples as well as un unfamiliar plants. On the Prince of Wales, Kualelo travelled back to England and resided largely in Plymouth with Johnson where he was inoculated against smallpox and sent to school. He'd sailed with Duncan again, commissioned by the Hudson's Bay Company to make an exploratory voyage across the Atlantic into far northern waters, which seems to have accomplished little. Kualelo had returned to London. He was now joining with Johnston and Menzies, what would be considered one of the great expeditions of the epoch. George Vancouver, one of Cook's former lieutenants, was the commander. His ship was the Discovery, and Discovery was its business from the European point of view. Yet it would take Kualelo not into the unknown, but back to his place of birth, to the port where his own <coughs> voyage had begun. In Vancouver's opinion, Kualelo hadn't in the least benefited by his residence in this country. Efforts to teach him to read had failed, but he'd proven good at drawing and particularly enjoyed dashing off caricatures of friends and acquaintances. He'd equipped himself with a number of prints of great London buildings, Westminster Abbey, Greenwich Hospital and St Paul's that he wanted to show to his people. The last was the building he'd called the Great House of God, Hare Nui Atua, and it was one he was said to have often gazed on with admiration and astonishment. A history of the Pacific should surely begin in the Pacific itself, but the occasion in London draws attention to the diverse and maybe unexpected voyages that make up the lives of islanders over the last 200 or so years. In general, it's assumed that dealings between in Europeans and indigenous peoples, whether in the Pacific, the Americas, or Africa, have amounted essentially to a series of depredations perpetrated by the former upon the latter, 
the incursions of explorers are followed by those of traders, missionaries, settlers, colonial powers, and latterly multinational companies and credit rating agencies. <laughs> These are histories, in other words, of impact. Pacific Islanders were those impacted upon. They're presumed not to have been mobile, not visitors, not making impacts themselves. Over the epoch of decolonization, historians came to emphasize that islanders, among other native peoples, were not merely victims but actors who resisted colonizers' impositions or creatively accommodated them. This rethinking was associated with a broader effort to understand colonial histories in a two-sided way, complementing the old emphasis on European policy and practice with an account of the perspectives of the colonized. If the necessity of this step was obvious, it also raised or begged a host of questions, both practical and philosophical. The issue most relevant here is that the both sides rhetoric preserved the idea that on one side we found indigenous communities, communities that were bounded, firmly situated in place and culturally coherent. Islanders still seem in situ, the local, local opponents, translators or recipients of global forces, meanings and commodities that emanate largely from the West. Kualelu's story suggests a Pacific history written around different assumptions. There's a cultural condition that we rarely attribute <coughs> to native people at all and never at this early stage of their interactions with the colonial world, that of cosmopolitanism. As Menzies wrote, barely a decade after contacts between Hawaiians and Europeans had been inaugurated by Cook's visits, Kualelo was prompted to visit not only England, but several other parts of the globe. He encountered a range of Pacific Islanders, the indigenous peoples of Northwest America and the Arctic, the ports of China and Europe, the multicultural decks of naval and merchant ships, and London, a place of starkly unequal social classes, and already in the late 18th century, one of diverse immigrants and refugees. If Kualelu did not lose his engravings on the way home, printed pictures of British temples were being shown to Hawaiians at the same time as images of Hawaiian temples were being shown to Britons. But I think we already understand that the European discovery of the Pacific was accompanied by a Pacific discovery of Europe. In this talk, I want to illustrate a different point, although a simple one, about Pacific history. If we think of natives as locals, islanders were never natives. In the 1774 encounter dramatized here, or for that matter, the 1922 meeting shown in this photograph, left and right did not, do not, correspond to global and local. I have a simple point too about art, about the great Pacific artifacts that grace institutions such as the British Museum, the Pitt Rivers in Oxford, and MAA in Cambridge where I work. Works have been celebrated in part because they are representative of ancient cultures. A good many of them might to the contrary be celebrated celebrated because they represent those cultures' transformations, their modernity. I'll conclude with a third, perhaps less simple point about what, given all this, we now take the collections held by these museums and others here, like the American Museum of Natural History, what we take these collections to represent and reveal. In no part of the world is the stereotype of the closed customary society more profoundly misleading than in the Pacific. It didn't require the stimulus of Western contact to make islanders' lives intersocial. I put this object up because it's one of many that was made in one place but collected in another. That is, it moved between places before it was acquired by Europeans. In Vanuatu, in northern New Guinea, even in the more widely separated archipelagos of eastern Oceania, communities were linked by exchange systems and trade routes that saw raw materials and specialised products, but also intangibles such as songs and spells regularly gifted or trafficked. Maps like these of such networks are mind-boggling. 
but there are no diagrams for the imaginations that such wide-ranging and manifold relationships engendered. Consciousness everywhere was regional and relational as well as culturally particular. This knowledge of a wider world that islanders to varying degrees <coughs> already possessed was rapidly enlarged during the earliest decades of sustained contact, particularly in Polynesia. In the wake of Cook's voyages, traders such as Kualelo's captains began seeking furs from the American Northwest, which they sold on in China. The establishment of the British colony in Sydney stimulated further commercial ventures, and ships were soon calling frequently for refreshment in Tahiti and Hawaii and at many other islands they knew of or happened upon. Almost anywhere ships stopped, one or two mariners tended to desert, and one or two eager islanders were recruited to replace them. A good many of these Pacific maritime workers made their way eventually home, but many instead, or on the way, left ships at islands other than their own. Before contact intensified, a few Tahitians might, for example, have been found in the Cook Islands, blown there in the course of a storm, while Tongans, Fijians and Samoans had long made regular and reciprocal visits. But by as early as 1800, there were also Hawaiians in the Marquesas, Tahiti and Fiji, Maori in Tahiti, and Tahitians in Tonga and Palau. A decade or so later, there were very likely hundreds of temporary or permanent islander migrants within the region. So, not only had individuals such as Kualelo visited Asian ports and European cities, they'd called it a good many Pacific islands, discovering peoples with whom they had ancestral links, but who had lived beyond the ambit of regular canoe voyages. Those who travelled, those who received travellers, those who heard stories when travellers returned, all gained a new sense of a plethora of communities sharing certain oceanic affinities and of other more distant and profoundly different societies. They made comparisons, they noted differences, they acted upon them. We know that these interactions took place but Europeans were often mere bystanders to them, hence their nature and ramifications are at best obliquely recorded in the European documentary record. But for Tahiti, which together with Hawaii was the crucible for the transformation of the Pacific over the first decades of the 19th century, <coughs> we have a clearer sense. Captain Cook's reports had made the reality of practices such as human sacrifice vivid and immediate, Evangelicals were powerfully affected, and the 1790s witnessed new excitement around the prospects for missionary work. The founding venture of the London Missionary Society entailed what they called a plan of great extent and importance, the establishment of a Tahitian mission that would provide a staging point for the conversion of the Pacific. On the 16th of March, 1797, the venture appeared to get off to an auspicious start. The High Chief, Pomare I, through his priest, shown speaking here, ceded the entire district of Martavai to the mission, the new arrivals thought. In fact, um, the offer was of a place to stay, and since um, Pomare enjoyed no sovereignty over the island as a whole but was involved in ongoing conflict with rivals, it was conditional upon military assistance. Earlier European visitors such as the Bounty Mutineers had helped their friends and hosts by fighting alongside them, so it was naturally assumed that the missionaries might do the same. The mismatch of expectations meant that the deal would come unstuck, <coughs> even before a celebratory historical painting and engraving were produced back in London. But if the missionaries' plan of great extent was almost immediately diminished and compromised, it nevertheless progressed through fits and starts. The man who'd become known as Pomare II, who already outranked his father and was thus shown carried upon an attendant's shoulders, would spend the succeeding 20 years doing his best to turn the missionary's error that he was a king into a truth. But in so doing, he was inspired and closely guided by a third party, an irritant to the missionary's effort to introduce and broker Western civilization. Just 12 months after the evangelist's landing, the trading ship Nautilus arrived seeking supplies. The missionaries angered Pomare by obstructing a trade in muskets and gunpowder, 
but also by trying to round up five Hawaiian deserters. These men stayed on and made themselves useful to Pomare in ways the missionaries could not, and they were soon prominent members of his entourage. The missionaries grudgingly acknowledged them to be a daring and hardened race, but lamented their influence. Their wickedness involved setting up stills and trafficking in alcohol, but had broader dimensions to it. One of the Hawaiians had been to England and was constantly telling him, that is Pomare, something of what he saw there, so that his ideas of things are much enlarged. Pomare II became increasingly aware of Kamehameha's conquest of the whole Hawaiian archipelago and his establishment of a true kingdom. He was made aware of Hawaiian techniques and strategies of sovereignty and warfare, of ways of dealing with Europeans and what Europeans elsewhere had offered and perpetrated. In 1808, during a crisis, the chief, ho the chief hoped he would recover his authority, but remarked in an offhand way to one of the missionaries that perhaps the people would cut off his head as the people of France had done with their king. <laughs> A similar understanding of what was going on in a wider world lay behind opposition to the few petty commercial ventures attempted by the mission. In 1818, a scheme to establish a sugar plantation had to be hastily abandoned in consequence of the king's jealousy, excited by false alarms insinuated into his mind that slavery and the culture of the cane were necessarily associated. Pomare never travelled beyond the archipelagos that in due course became subject to him, but for the remainder of his life he had these Hawaiians or other Hawaiians around him and he would remain a cosmopolitan in his mind. Not long he, before he died, he asked William Crook, a missionary he'd known for over 20 years, to point out Lima in the map that hung up in his house and he pointed out Cape Horn as a place he knew well and the River Amazonia under the line. He amused himself, Cook, Crook wrote, by looking over the West India Islands and Jamaica in particular from whence Mr Giles, a fellow missionary, came. He said he was going to send some Sandwich Islanders, that is some Hawaiians, to Teteroa, a neighbouring atoll, to make salt as they'd learned to make it in their own country. Um, sorry. As Pomare had been inspired by Hawaiian history, Maori and Marquesans were in turn inspired by Tahitian events. One Fetoi, a North Island Maori chief, went as far as to rename himself Pomare, his settlement Matui, Matui after Tahiti's Matavai Bay, and ally, ally himself with missionaries as he understood Pomare had done. On Tahuata in the southern Marquesas in the 1830s, a chief gave David Darling an account of why he was unable to convert that the missionary found convoluted. He, he Iateti, was heavily tattooed. He knew that Pomare I had been tattooed and that it was under Pomare II that Christianity had been embraced. Therefore, it should be under his own son, who was not tattooed, that Marquesans would turn to the church and Iateti hoped to create a kingdom of their own. In short, the radical changes associated with conversion to Christianity that were marked by differences in dress, work, the organisation of time, architecture and sexuality, among other domains, were embraced not because a European project was acquiesced in or even locally appropriated, but to an important degree via a kind of reenactment, an interest in restaging a transformation that had been splendidly accomplished by islanders elsewhere. The first great driver of Pacific cosmopolitan imaginations in the colonial age was, as we've seen, commerce. The growing mutual awareness among islanders via the decks of the increasing numbers of traders and whalers from the 1790s onwards. The second great force would be the evangelical project <coughs> itself, since Pomare's conversion and ascendancy in Tahiti, accomplished by 1815, would be succeeded by a sustained effort to spread the gospel to the west through the Cook Islands, Samoa, Tonga and Fiji into southern Melanesia and by the end of the 19th century to the Pacific's continent, the great populous and multilingual island of New Guinea. Islanders were not always receptive to the word of God. 
but um, in many instances those typically referred to as native teachers were in the vanguard and were better able to excite prospective converts than white missionaries. Tahitians played key roles in securing Christian conversion in much of the Cook Islands and Samoa. For example, Samoans and Fijians went on to work extensively in Melanesia. The New England missionaries dispatched Hawaiians to many parts of Micronesia, and so on. One of Christianity's great draws for islanders was literacy. Um, I'm sorry, I'll skip those for the moment. Um, Early on, Pomare, among others, was intrigued by script, print, and books. By late 1803, he'd learned to make the letters of the English alphabet, to know their names, and to put them together so as to form sundry words and short sentences. Um, and this is a photocopy of what was the earliest extant letter from him, from 1810. Around this time, the missionary standardised a Tahitian orthography, and only six months later, he, he was in the habit of writing short letters. He asked them to build a small house which might be set aside for him to write in and in due course regularly kept a private journal. It would be easy to impute a naive fetishism to the chief to suggest that he and other Polynesians thought writing to be in some way magical. In fact, they did consider it a practice charged with power because it was. Pomare may well have known that in Hawaii, Kamehameha had written to King George III <coughs> soliciting the gift of a ship a request eagerly supported by naval men concerned to sustain British influence in the arch archipelago that therefore did result in the presentation of a small vessel. Writing was, for these islanders, a technology of modernity. It made their action at a distance more effective. It enabled them to seek out alliances and to seek gifts of great and potent things. The movement of commerce and Christianity across the Pacific was notably uneven, some places intensively visited early on, others isolated until much later. Broadly speaking, much of Melanesia and particularly the peoples of the interiors of large islands had rel relatively limited engagements with Europeans until the second half of the 19th century, and parts of Polynesia too came within the amber only during the 1860s and 1870s. Among them was Easter Island or Rapa Nui, though first called at by Europeans early in the 1720s and visited again by Cook, La Perouse and others who published images of the Ahu Mohai, the great <coughs> statues for the first time, it had been judged impoverished by Cook and was hence seldom called at. That Rapa Nui was an island of mystery would become one of the biggest cliches of popular representation of the Pacific. Who settled the island and who created and erected the the Ahu Moai were in fact questions answered easily early on. The statues were remarkable elaborations, but elaborations nonetheless, of closely related stone sculptures commemorating post potent ancestors mm -hmm. that had counterparts in cultures across the Pacific. Rapa Nui did, however, offer something more like a genuine enigma. After a short visit in 1864, the Catholic priest Eugène A. Rode had reported in detail to his superiors back in Paris. Though mainly concerned to drum up support <coughs> for a formal mission establishment, he dedicated one paragraph to a singular discovery. <coughs> in all of the houses, he wrote, he'd found wooden tablets or staffs covered with sorts of hieroglyphic characters. He was unsure of the meaning of the characters, but considered that they amounted to a script. The report was printed in a missionary annual and then republished in Globus, an influential geographical journal. The news soon reached anthropological circles and was considered sensational. Announcements were made at meetings of bodies such as the Ethnological Society in London, and Adolf Bastian, director of the Museum for Volkerkunde in Berlin, and the most influential German anthropologist of the epoch, was among those captivated. The treasure was there to be unlocked, but the tragedy was that the key appeared to have been lost. Right from the start, A. Rhodes suspected that Rapa Nui he had encountered in 1864 no longer had the capacity to read the Rongo Rongo. Bishop Josen in Tahiti likewise struggled to introduce Rapa Nui in his household and who he otherwise knew to help him decipher the script <coughs> 
but his best informant freely acknowledged that he did not know the motif's significance. What he could do, and what he did, was to perform. He held the board and chanted, as he understood experts in the old days had done. Succeeding field workers had the same experience. Rapa Nui tried to help, but volunteered versions of Rongo Rongo meanings that turned out to be inconsistent. In Moby Dick, Herman Melville had evoked the tattoos of Queequeg, his Polynesian sailor traveller, the work of a departed prophet and seer of his island who by these hieroglyphic marks had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume but whose mysteries not even himself could read. An esoteric writing system, an ancient cryptography, was considerably more alluring than the texts that actually could be read, the myths that by this time were being widely transcribed and translated by anthropologically <coughs> minded missionaries and administrators <coughs> in other parts of the Pacific. Those who sought to decode the script from the late 19th century on presumed that the writing system was an ancient one brought perhaps by the first Polynesian settlers of the island or some other immigrant population, the identity of which was needless to say a favorite topic for speculation. What none of these inquirers did, however, was closely read the earliest voyage records, such as those from Cook's and La Perouse's visits. These sojourns were not extended, but mariners spent a good many hours ashore, touring the island, examining gardens, houses, and the Ahumoai. The visits were also, <coughs> relatively speaking, peaceful. Naturalists and sailors engaged a good deal with islanders. Artists made sketches, gifts were exchanged, and there were sexual contacts. The artefacts acquired included sacred images, ancestral figures, and the like. Hence, there's no evidence that <coughs> Rapa Nui willingly bartered certain things but held back others. So it's perplexing that important objects might have existed yet were never seen by these visitors. All the more so because the parties consisted not only of ordinary sailors and officers but naturalists and scientists who were passionately interested in anthropological topics <coughs> and alert to languages to what was then called comparative philology. Negative evidence can never be definitive, but there are strong grounds for considering that Rongo Rongo were neither observed nor collected before Ray Rhodes' visit because they didn't exist much earlier. Late 19th and early 20th century ethnologists were quick to claim that an indigenous culture was dying or dead, but failed to recognize that contact <coughs> with Europeans might stimulate invention. It's well known that Rapa Nui ritual changed dramatically over the period of early contact, the cult around the statues was abandoned and new practices emerged. When islanders elsewhere had the opportunity to appropriate European artefacts, customs or <coughs> technologies, they often did so. They bartered for guns, they drank alcohol and they worked diligently <coughs> with white missionaries or islanders who were already literate to learn to read and write. But when it was not possible for them to acquire or reproduce their own powerful and prestigious foreign forms, that interested them, they often created their own versions, for example by carving wooden clubs in the shapes of European swords and knives in Tonga and Samoa, and by creating structures out of stones or trees that mimicked ships, as they did in Samoa and also here yeah. on Rapa Nui. Unlike other Polynesians, Rapa Nui had no access to missionaries prior to the 1864 Catholic visit. They lay beyond the orbit of the London Missionary Society, the contagious enthusiasm that surrounded Christianity, <coughs> that led even those who were less visited, such as Austral Islanders, Tuamotuans and Tuvaluans, to seek teachers, clothes and books, in short, to enter the colonial modernity of the 19th century. But some experience in Tahiti or elsewhere, probably in the 1840s or 50s, represents the most likely <coughs> stimulus for the creation of these extraordinary objects. We do not know of any Rapa Nui man, men, women or women traveling away from and returning to the island in this period, but going on better documented histories, it's almost certain that some did so, that catechisms, letters, books, prayers or whatever 
caught the imagination of just one islander, perhaps just one islander, who came back and was sufficiently charismatic to excite others to stage some mimicry of the Christian routine and to school carvers toward an unprecedented form. If the specifics of this story are likely always to elude understanding, the balance of probabilities lies very heavily on the side of Rongo Rongo being a post-contact innovation <coughs> related to the autonomous quasi-Christian cults that islanders invented in many places. If this is so, the fascination of the ethnologists in the form exhibits great irony. For Bastian and others, the boards were remarkable because they instant an ancient, indeed a primordial script. Rongo Rongo were indeed remarkable, not as antiquities, but as expressions of a Polynesian modernity. <coughs> Commerce represented here, painted on the bark cloth of the island of Niue, had enlarged the inter-island imaginations that islanders already possessed. Conversion entailed new passages from island to island and new imaginations again. Um, those two slides I skipped over earlier were um, maps of the world, the Pacific and North America um, that were painted on bark cloth and were probably made in a Fijian mission school in the 1870s <coughs> or 80s. A third great driver of cross-cultural and cosmopolitan imagining in the Pacific was the process of labour migration. This had got underway in a piecemeal sense before 1850 as groups of men <coughs> from one island were persuaded to travel to others for periods of plantation work. As colonial settlements in Fiji, Samoa and New Caledonia expanded, <coughs> and the sugar economy in Queensland developed, the demand for workers escalated, and what would become a violent and controversial business, this is in Fiji in the 1870s, those men are probably from southern Vanuatu, um, got underway. It was widely understood that unscrupulous recruiters <coughs> routinely kidnapped men and women from various parts of Vanuatu and the Solomon Islanders, and there were indeed proven cases of abduction. Islanders who considered themselves wronged attacked boats and killed traders, while traders who were not infrequently guilty of preemptive violence or unauthorised punitive raids. Yet recruitment and migration <coughs> came to involve tens of thousands of Melanesians, and the great majority of those were willing recruits, younger men who had much to gain from travel, and the status that their experience and the goods that they brought back in due course earned them. The upshot was not only the experience of an onerous plantation regime and the ports and towns of Queensland, among other colonies, it was the formation of new communities among workers from many islands, the formation of a pidgin language and much else that they shared. I leave the debate about whether empire was bad or not so bad to Niall Ferguson and others. <laughs> My point to reiterate is that whatever else it was, <coughs> empire gave people lives both here and there. It foisted new imaginations upon those who travelled and also those who stayed at home. Labour recruitment engendered new art forms. Sorry. Um, such as shell inlaid guns and representations of um, weapons, new weapons, um, and these um, bead belts worn by Solomon Islands recruits photographed in studios in Queensland and Fiji. The artefacts do not tell us their own story, but they do indicate that some sort of relationship with the Union Jack and the power behind it was <coughs> important to these men. There's act, uh, we mostly know of these through photographs, but there are actual examples in the British Museum which are in the, the right colours, lest you assume that it's uh, just a geometric form that looks like the Union Jack. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 
More surprisingly, sculptures that appear entirely traditional, such as this f figure of a man from the village Sakavas on the island of Malo in North Vanuatu, are in fact also products of this moment of colonial engagement. The figure is among a small number of objects representing what are called les arts premiers in the Louvre. It's good that it's shown there and affirmed as a masterpiece. But as Michael Batsendal famously argued with, with respect to Fra Angelico and his contemporaries, it pays to pay attention to the blue paint, which um, in this case was produced not from ground down lapis lazuli, but what was in 19th century Melanesia, a similarly scarce and prestigious import. Reckitt's blue was regularly mentioned by labour traders among the goods such as mirrors and scissors that had to be distributed among the, skin, the kin of prospective recruits during often tense and hurried exchanges before a young man or woman would be allowed away to enter a boat. In the islands it was employed, needless to say, not as a laundry product but a paint on the man in the Louvre and similar sculptures such as this pair in Berlin and um, this fish um, in the Cambridge collection, which was collected by John Layard in the course of his enormously important early 20th century fieldwork. For all the upheaval and violence of the time, these works do not just represent a local culture, one that we take to have been threatened by change, they're expressions rather of a knowing engagement, a capacity against all the odds to balance the rapacious demands of an international economy against a group's interest in celebrating ancestors, indeed a capacity to celebrate them in what was a fresh and splendid way. The trend in a range of museums in Britain, Europe and elsewhere has been to rebrand anthropological as world cultures collections However desirable, indeed essential, it may be to acknowledge and affirm human variety, the rubric may do no more than the patently awkward category of les arts premiers to recognise that many of these great works spoke from the start of relationships across cultures. To be sure, <coughs> they expressed local meanings and beliefs and art styles, but they also express a no negotiation, their artefacts of encounter and engagement. To view them from Europe as exemplifications of the cultures of elsewhere is to overlook the sense that their creation was an act that engaged Europe, that reached over um, both sides of those images that have Europeans on the left and Islanders on the right. I don't mean to suggest that Islanders, uh, that objects of this kind should be valued not for the authenticity that the Louvre suggests they bear, but for a hybridity that marks the mixed-up world we all inhabit. That caption would only obscure the work of Pacific art in a different way. We'd still lose any particular sense of Islanders' creations and Islanders' projects, indeed of the global salience of a form of sociality that was made up from the start of relationships rather than groups or identities. We'd miss any sense that the creation or the presentation of such a work of art might be a form of action, a way of dealing with Europeans, a technique of engagement with them. A Maori object um, that recently entered the collections of the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge suggests possibilities of this kind. Its maker was Tene Waitari, um, born in about 1854, um, died in 1931, one of the great Maori artists of the colonial period and the carver of the Tamoko panel, an icon of oceanic art in the collections of Te Papa, the National Museum of New Zealand. Whitery was trained in a customary context and had a profound understanding of customary techniques and forms, but is renowned for departing from them, both in works created for non-Maori, such as the panel, essentially an illustration of male and female tattoo, commissioned by an ethnologist and colonial mu museum director, and for Maori clients for whom, for example, he created this monument in a European form. <coughs> 
Whitery was also involved in carving houses for kin and for other tribes, such as Hinamihi. Um, famously um, acquired by Lord Onslow, a colonial governor, and brought back by him to the family estate, Clandon Park in um, Surrey, where this photograph was taken, a uh, little way outside London. Though other uh, expatriate whitery carvings, um, uh, such as a model canoe in the British Museum, which was gifted to the Duke and Duchess of York and Cornwall in 1903, were well known among interested Maori researchers and curators, a major work located on a naval base in Portsmouth came to light only a few years ago. Maori had a long interest, a long history of interest in European expressions of power and sovereignty and began themselves to create flag and flags and flagpoles in the second half of the 19th century. Fully carved posts, square in section, typically incorporated a cross piece and the sub suspension of flags from angled ropes suggests that the intention was to mimic the array of pennants that might be displayed on a sailing ship. By the early 20th century, at any rate, poles known as pohaki were commonly erected beside meeting houses, and it was a pole of this kind that was presented together with a host of other gifts when Edward, Prince of Wales, <coughs> visited Rotorua in 18, April 8, 1920 on a tour of the Dominions to convey the King's thanks for their support during the First World War, which, needless to say, was a further process that brought islanders, among other peoples, into contact with each other in an imperial theatre. The prince, um, um, on his return to England, um, presented um, the flagpole to the commander of HMS Excellent, a shore base in Portsmouth Harbour, where it was erected in a rose garden in the previous photograph and remained for some 85 years. Though it was in good condition, given its extended exposure to coastal weather, at the time it was examined by the, in 2007 by the carver's descendant, James Schuster, and myself, it was clear that it needed to be moved somewhere indoors. The family welcomed the suggestion that the pohaki might be placed in the context of other Maori and Pacific works in Cambridge and displayed for a wider public there, in due course, the Ministry of Defence agreed that it could be moved to the museum on deposit, and we proceeded to make arrangements for its physical move and for conservation work. A question that was not much discussed was whether the flagpole could or should be returned to New Zealand. It having been a gift to the Crown, made its staying in Britain appropriate from the family and the community's point of view. There was a good deal more debate about its conservation. The standard approach in museums today would preserve the object in the state it was at the time it entered the institution, but Jim Schuster pointed out that were the Pohaki at home, it would be given a good coat of paint, um, and that not renewing it in some way implied um, a lack of care. Options such as the emulation of traditional stains were considered, but in the end, Jim's proposal was that a coat of linseed oil would reinvigorate the wood and create an appearance consistent with those of other historic carvings in the museum. A year later, a ceremony took place, blessing and marking the flagpole's arrival, possibly unprecedented, as um, an instance of a major historic artefact entering a European museum with the active support of members of the family and community concerned. A report in the New Zealand Herald was headlined, Historic Flagpole Recovers Its Mana. At the very time the Pohaki was making its way across the seas, Emile Durkheim's pupil and nephew, Marcel Mauss, was composing in Paris what would in due course be considered one of the foundational works of 20th century anthropology, his essay Sur le Don, published in English as The Gift. Many here will have studied and taught the book and don't need me to remind you that one of its key sources of inspiration, indeed of the entire book's paradigm, was a quotation from the Maori elder Tamati Ramai Piri, outlining the spirit of the gift in terms that have been much debated ever since. 
Now this ta'onga I received from him is the spirit, the how of the ta'onga I received from you and which I passed on to him. The ta'onga which I received on account of the ta'onga that came from you, I must return to you, I must give them to you since they are the how of the ta'onga which you gave me. I'm struck by the sense in which both the Pohaki and Moses texts were products of the First World War. Mos served himself and survived, but many of his peers, a whole cohort of French sociologists and ethnologists, died on the Western Front. The gift ended with a set of what Mos called ethical conclusions. It's by opposing reason to emotion and setting up the will to peace against rash follies that people succeed in substituting alliance, gift and commerce for war, isolation and stagnation. There's no other cause feasible, he wrote. The Maori, for their part, had gifted um, their service and in some cases their lives to the cause of the crown and the empire. Um, I'm not sure if you can read that caption. That's uh, um, Maori uh, um, performing a haka for uh, um, New Zealand Prime Minister and I think his deputy um, in France in um, 1918. In return, they were honoured by a visit from the prince and they recognised that honour through gifts, including the pohaki. anyone inclined to read their participation, their presentations, as an expression of colonial civility, might look at the relative positions of the flags on the occasion. Mm -hmm. These gifts were assertive. They sought to remind the crown of long-standing obligations to Maori dating back to the treaty, the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi that had been neglected, they implied some form of tribal sovereignty within the empire. When we exhibit the pohaki, we exhibit many things, a work of art by an individual master, an artefact of a hybrid history, the heritage of a particular people, but also and above all a gift the thing given is not inert. It is animated, often personified. It tends to return to what Hertz called its place of origin or to produce for the clan and the land from which it originated an equivalent to replace it. The gift in general, like Moses' book, is concerned with the future. It's an expression of hope, a question. The thing having been given, one asks what will come of that what will become of us now? The challenge for us as curators in Cambridge is to exhibit not only the object but the gift, not only the gift but the question. What could Britain, the Crown, or the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology offer the clan, Nati Tarafai, Maori in general? What tangible or intangible thing <coughs> might we give that would in some sense replace this remarkable thing. <laughs>